two, two, one, two, two. Two, two, one, two. Mic check. Hey. It's on. Hey, hey. All righty. Hello, my name is Geraint. And just a little heads up for anyone who's roaming around the building. I'm about to start my talk in a couple of minutes. So if you want to get cozy, bring a nice drink, a couple of biscuits, and hopefully learn a thing or two about macro photography, you've got a couple of minutes before I um, start screaming the house down. I'll turn the mic back off a minute, just in case, innit? If I stand over here, am I out of the way of everyone's view? Yeah, I stood there before. <laughs> Blocked it. <laughs> One, two, mic check. Can you all hear me? I reckon we can make a start now. Good to go? All right, cheers now. If we live stream in at the same time? I think so. Hello, if you're watching at home. Best technology as well, and they made the effort at this time of day. Hello, everyone. How are we all doing? Way. Thank you ever so much for coming, especially at this time of day as well. Are we all filled up on coffee and biscuits? Ready to go? Um, I will just start with a very brief introduction. Hello, my name is Geraint. And now let's get into it. Told you it was going to be brief, didn't I? I thought it'd be quite fun for me to share with you a little bit of a journey on where this macro photography thing kind of all began. And if there's any newcomers to macro photography amongst us, um, you know, we see some incredible images out there, don't we? I know 
I'm not the best macro photographer in the world, that's not what I'm saying, but I've picked up a couple of things that are probably beneficial. But we all start somewhere, and this is actually um, one of my first ever macro photos. Everyone wins if I stand down here. So this is a Mayfly Nymph, I think, if I remember correctly, and it was shot back in the day with a Nikon D80, a Sigma 75 to 300 macro, no, 75 to 300 with a macro built in, and a Rhinox DCR 250 clicked onto the front of it. And this, I found it in an email from 2010. I really want to get into macro shots, so here's two half decent ones. I only showed you one. This is the better of the two half decent ones. It's, still, it's not bad. And then I only had the Rhinox for the day, and I had to shoot handheld because of the ground. Don't, yeah, don't know what that means. No. I didn't, they didn't respond to the email. <laughs> now we know why. But that's the picture. But from a technical perspective, it's fine. It's fine, you know, there's enough depth of field on there, it's just, you know, the composition maybe is a little bit off and the lighting's not incredible, is it? I'm gonna have to stand back up here now, because <laughs> I can't see my pictures. I began shooting professionally within one year of buying a camera. Um, I was doing events and things like this. It wasn't necessarily nature photography. So as you can see, I've got a fireman there. Um, Bridge End Fire Station were very kind to let me come down there and photograph them when they were training one day when I was a university student. Really, really cool. Um, behind the scenes kind of imagery, low light, really challenging, so that was fun. But at the same time, I was really interested in macro photography, and you could see just in there that there was a bit of a jumble of things that I was working on. There was people and bugs, so there was a bit of a defining line where I had to decide, okay, which direction am I gonna go here? Things are building. And as you can see, I went with the bugs. Um, in 2016, I decided that I'm gonna stop every other genre of photography, concentrate on macro, try to get half decent at it and just see what happens. Plus it was the thing that I kind of enjoyed the most anyway. This photograph made it into the um, Outdoor Photographer of the Year book in 2017. It was, um, it's a splayed deer fly. It bit me, it landed on the flower in my garden, and I managed to take this uh, focus stack of it. At the time, I had a full-frame camera system, and I had this many extension tubes, and then a backwards 24mm prime lens. Really difficult way of shooting. Um, but it did spur me on, it gave me a little bit of a confidence boost. And these little things, um, they could be a lifeline for a lot of the time. They inspire you to keep going. Um, I think it was about 2017, 2018, I bought, um, I swapped over from my Nikon uh, system over to Olympus at the time. It shifted my needs a lot more. Um, but it was that, um, it was when Olympus took me on, saw something in me really, and then it basically kicked open a whole bunch of opportunities for me. And you know, it's largely why I'm here today. It's really cool, isn't it? But since then, it's been quite a journey. I mean, I've been working with um, OM System now. I'm thankfully, I'm one of their ambassadors. I've collaborated with Woodland Trust. I write for Nature TTL. I've been featured by the BBC, at the WWF, and I speak here, of course, and at the photography show. It's been quite, quite an epic journey so far. And it's nice, I still feel like I'm getting started. Um, I've got a long way to go yet, but you know, this is super meaningful. And this year's been a good one. I've won my first ever award. Um, I was runner-up in the Botanical Britain category in the British Wildlife Photography Awards this year, so I'm still pinching myself over that. My friend Matt won the category, and it's an insanely beautiful image of a sundew eating a horsefly. I mean, to come close up to that is quite an honor, isn't it? But that's where the journey began, and that's one of my last pictures from last year. They're not that different, really. It's the only thing really that's changed is the approach and mastering to some degree uh, how to compose and mastering a macro lens actually, because there is a different world. And just paying a little bit more attention to the subject and the light. Why macro photography? Purely because I think it's fun. I love it. It's like Peter Pan syndrome. I call it that. It reconnects with your childhood. And I just think it's amazing. I love it. I mean, we spend our time out in nature exploring, looking for cool, cool things to photograph. Why not? I, I think it's the most accessible form of photography there is. 
we can shoot macro images of anything. You know, I'm a nature macro photographer, but you can, with a macro lens, photograph anything, and it could be cool. So I'm hoping that some of the tips that I have today might be actually applicable to whatever genre of photography we're using. Before we get into it, I'll run through the camera assist that I'm using. So I'm using the, the OM-1. I also got the 60 millimeter macro lens. I use the FL900R flash from Olympus. And if I use the 60 mil and I want some extra magnification, then I'll pop on some extension tubes as well. I also have the 30 millimeter macro lens. Um, I actually have three macro lenses and I use them all at various you know, different times. My favorite one so far is the 90 mil. I, I love it. It's so flexible and it allows me to be really, really creative. And when I say flexible, I don't mean that it bends. Like, I mean that it's, <laughs> it's really good and it allows me to shoot very creatively. And it's actually been a bit of um, a revolution in the way I can shoot now. But we'll get to that in a second. So this is um, the field of view with the 30 mil macro. That's the 60 and that's the 90. And these are from exactly the same place. I mounted on a tripod. So that these are just some things to bear in mind. If you haven't got a macro lens yet, the focal length means that we can fill the frame from slightly further away. You can get that same field of view with the 60 or a 30, but it just means you have to get a lot, lot closer. For the most part nowadays, I'm using the OM-1 with the 90, and instead of extension tubes, we can use teleconverters now. So the 90 will accept teleconverters, so it means you can put a times two teleconverter on there, and then you extend your focal range twice, but also the magnification gets extended twice as well. It's astonishing. So things like springtails, which are one of my favorite creatures in the world to photograph, they're only millimeter, two millimeter, something like that. You can fill the frame with those now. It's really challenging to shoot with it, though, with the times two handheld. It's tricky. So bear that in mind. Um, I got the FL900 on the flash and the diffuser. So this is it, really. That's basically what I carry around with me. It's really nice, reasonably portable, considering this lens is um, 180 millimeters in terms of a macro focal length. It's not that bad, and it focuses to four times lifelike as well. So it's really, really, really quite something. I got a tripod now. So for those of you who know me, you know that I've been basically slating tripods for like a long, long time, haven't I? I don't like them, but I got hold of Jay from Three-Legged Thing, and that coupled with my 90 mil is a really, 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 really good setup. It's changed the way I shoot quite drastically, and uh, there's something very different about using a tripod. It reduces the amount of opportunities we have, because if you've got a flash and there's a bug there, you're probably going to get a photograph. And by the time you set your tripod up, the bugs largely move away in these things. But there's also a positive side to that, and I found that it's been quite nice, actually, to slow the pace down. And by keeping a little bit of distance, slowing things down, I found that I can connect with nature a little bit differently, and the images that I'm getting, I've got a, basically a serenity to them that I can't really get if I'm working with a flash. Because if you're that close up and you're lighting something, it will respond to you, you just do a bit slightly, but then that means we're engaging pictures and things like that. So it's not a bad thing, but it just means that we can change it around. But look how cool this is, right? You can take all the legs off, Jay, and then you can screw these funny little feet on, they're called vans, which are really cool anyway. And then you can get your, you can get your camera and your macro lens into some really, really tricky situations. So that is a damselfly that was newly emerged, not going anywhere, and it means that I can shoot natural light portraits of them now which is cool. So that's the resultant image I managed to get from there. It's wild, isn't it? But it looks like flash, isn't it? It looks like that clarity and everything. So this is a, a focus stack that I shot in camera with my OM-1, my 90 mil attached to the J, but with all the legs taken off him. I put him back on again, I'm not mean. S if you're kind of torn between the 60 and the 90, there are a couple of considerations that we need to look at. And I l absolutely love my 90, but I also love the 60. It's like, um, I love them both equally, but they have very different applications. The big advantage, I would say, that the 90 has, aside from the obvious ones, like extra reach and magnification, is that it lets in more light. So you can see that these two pictures, there's probably about two stops of difference in there, but the picture on the left is the 90. The one on the right is the 60, and they have uh, identical exposure settings. They've shot in manual with the same shutter speed aperture and ISO. So it lets in way more light, and that is massively beneficial for things like focus stacking especially. 
Another th consideration to make is uh, the longer macro lens, 90, produces less depth of field. So both of these are shot at f9, and the one on the left has got a shallower depth of field than the 60 mil on the right. It might be difficult for you to notice from there, but it's just the compression of it. So it's a matter of perspective as to whether that's good or bad for you, really. I like to use it creatively anyway. I like the fact that I can stop down a little bit and still maintain a shallow depth of field, but your subject is still reasonably sharp. Let's get into some juicy camera settings. So I got, I've got, i set my camera for basically two different approaches. There's high mag with flash, and then there's everything else. And if I'm using high magnifications with a flash, these are my settings. My shutter speed will start between the 50th and 250th. I'll be at either f3.5 to f14 now. If you've got the 90 mil, we can stop it past f8. The 60 is a little bit limited in terms of diffraction, but um, the 90, I don't really care about those things now. I can just shoot at f14 if I want. And the ISO is between 200 and 1600 if I'm using the OM1. That used to be mostly for necessity and for shooting what's in front of me. But over the past 18 months, a lot of things have changed in the way I shoot, really. And these are mostly due to, down to practical applications more than anything else now, and creative applications. So by mastering flash, it took me ages. Other people might get ahead of me. I'm just a slow learner. By actually mastering it, it means that I can get a wide variety of images within moments of each other. So it's a very similar subject two damsel plays, but you'll notice that um, one of them has got a really bright green background, the other one has got a dark background. And that is down to how we expose the ambient lighting in our cameras. So I'm going to click back a minute. You see on, you see if I got a 50th, f3.5, a 200. Anything that we do inside of the camera is related to the ambient light, the ambient exposure. And then we adjust the flash accordingly. So. The one with a bright green background, I shot with an aperture of f6.3, but I bumped the ISO up to 640 just to pull in that extra ambient light. Whereas the one with a dark background would have had a smaller aperture and a lower ISO and a faster shutter speed. Because then you're basically just exposing all of the ambient light out, and then it makes it look like it's in a studio. Aesthetics is choice, isn't it? Like, who prefers the one with the green background? Who prefers the one with the black background? Who hates both of them? <laughs> <laughs> There's only two of you, thank goodness. <laughs> I also like to enable the rule of thirds grid inside of my camera. It's got a couple of uses. One of them is composing, make sure that everything kind of looks pretty. It's also very useful for making sure that horizon lines are straight. And in macro, we don't actually have horizon lines as such quite often, but we do have straight lines. So you see that crab spider, he's like, Gary, give me a cut. And I was like, I gotta make sure that the camera is tilted first, make sure that your arms are level. Um, because if, if you're shooting close up to something and you decide, oh my golly, I need to rotate it later because I didn't shoot it well, then you're gonna chop some of those legs off, potentially. So get your compositions right in camera, even if the exposure is a little bit off. Now we've got all that out of the way, my camera settings for everything else is aperture priority mode. Easy. You just pick your aperture, your shutter speed does what it wants. As long as it's not too blurry, then you can just bump your ISO up. It's really nice and simple. I love to shoot with aperture priority mode. And then you control your exposure using your EV value, the little plus or minus thing. But it means that we're working with natural light. So we're not just simply out under natural light, and we're looking for where the light is, and we're working with it. Even if there's no light, we can still work with whatever's there. So my least favorite form of lighting is basically what it's like today outside. When it's boiling hot, it's great for us, but for things like insects, it means they're really active. Great, nothing's staying still. But also, things get a bit difficult to control. Even flowers, when they've got petals like this, see those highlights on there? If they were out in direct light, then we'd be losing all the highlight detail there. However, one of my favorite things to do is to find maybe like a water source, like a river or something like that. And if you've got a subject that's in shade, like this flower was, the light reflecting on the water in the background can produce some really, that's not working. Is that still working? Yeah. Can produce some really magical ethereal effects. This is my like thing. I 
sparkly backgrounds of Boca. I'm a bit of like a nude with it. I'm sure in five years I'll look back around and go, what were you thinking? But I love it for now anyway. But this is a single shot, f5.6, using autofocus. And it's largely just trying to compose and make things look pretty. But that night email is really nice, isn't it? It's like beautiful compression, and it's like blowing that background away. And because I can shoot at f5.6, that compression just means that there's more of my subject in focus, but the background remains nicely diffuse. This is my little, I'm going to hug it, my little first award winner. And if you're shooting in snow and things like this, then your camera is going to try to underexpose the picture, isn't it? So we have to, in that, if we use an aperture or shutter speed priority mode or even manual, we have to factor that in. So I overexpose this picture by one stop. But it was really challenging to get enough of it in focus. Um, so I shot it at f2.8 and then did an um, in-camera focus stack then, just to make sure that I got enough depth of field on the subject without having to sacrifice uh, my shutter speed. If you've got a tripod or whatever, you don't have to really worry too much about that. Um, before I go on, this is another thing I've noticed. So you know uh, my camera's got focus stack built in, right? Um, it's when I put my camera on a tripod, I realized how vital that is under natural lighting conditions. Because, you know, if you've shot macro outside, the wind is the enemy, isn't it? <laughs> I always nearly ripped my hair out. And then um, you'd like, you can shoot a focus stack, and then halfway through, the thing will start like moving, and then you're like crying or whatever, eating biscuits because you're sad. But my camera's got confirmation, isn't it? So if it's... If the stack works there, then it's going to work when I get home. And I've been sat by like a flower with a damselfly on it for like half an hour because the windy conditions were awful. So I just sat there with a the camera on the tripod, found my composition, and I just basically shot stacks until it worked out. If we go out with better time, then I won't have to deal with that. A little while ago, I said that even a lack of light can be used quite well and quite creatively. So I went out first thing in the morning. And it's just been raining, and this um, crocus was absolutely covered. And um, using soft, overcast, natural lighting, it means that we can control the highlights of things like this. Um, I shot, again, this is an in-camera focus stack of eight images, because I use it quite often just to make sure that the backgrounds are diffuse. Remember when I said my favorite lighting conditions are when your subject is in shade and the background's illuminated? This is the same thing. So this is shot with my E-M1X I used to have. I love that camera. With the Olympus 60 millimeter macro lens. And the hoverfly was landed on this flower. And the sun was coming from behind me. So I was cast in a physical shadow over the subject itself. If I moved away, it would have been sunny on it again. So I quite often like to position myself as basically a sun guard, which is a really cool name, actually. I'm going to change my instant name to that later. So it means that my subject is diffuse, but there's still a lot of natural light illuminating the background there. And you can do these things in one shot as well. Shoot an F8 or something, and then you can get your bug doing something with nice complementary colors. Again, I like to get kind of like creative with my shooting, and I'm trying to get a little bit more artistic in the way I shoot. Um, for years, I was kind of obsessed with, you know, close-up portraits of bugs' faces, and I did them, I think, forever. But there's only so much I can do with that lately, and I found that by kind of shooting plants and flowers, that's allowed me to diversify my skill sets because things aren't moving. So that pressure of, holy smokes, i got to get it, that's gone because your subject isn't going anywhere. So I've been experimenting with white balance a lot. So I shot this picture of a fern in my garden, and it was basically at the end of the day, but there was a little patch of light just illuminating it, but it was like slightly backlit. So I put my white balance into tungsten, and then that made it look kind of blue and ethereal looking. So that's just a creative decision. Um, if you prefer it looking warm and naturalistic, there's like no right or wrong way of doing these things. But I think, give them a go, because we can do it in raw later, but we're not making decisions in the moment if we do it afterwards because we're not seeing how the light is working and how the things are working. So yes, it's more practical to shoot auto and then check it later, but we can't make creative decisions in the field unless we can see exactly what we're dealing with. And if you haven't got a macro lens, don't stress it. This was taken with my 12 to 40, and um, 
uh, like the beautiful thing with the micro full fluid system is that all our lenses basically focus really close. So this 12 to 40 was taken at 80 millimeters, but it focuses honestly to things like this. It's really, really cool. I backlit it and then I just allowed a little bit of sun flare to come through and make it look like it's illuminating this little flower there. It's a wood an anemone needle there first time. Uh, but you'll notice that it's on the verge of being clipped. So I had to expose for the brightest part, which is just the tip of the petals, and then bring the exposure back up later in post. We've got to protect our highlights at all costs. So I love crab spiders. You know, you were saying, like, they're all in my garden. We couldn't find them. Anyone seeing crab spiders around their place yet? One, two, three. That's pretty good. I've got four that live in my garden, and one of them is a bee assassin. I've had to have words with her. It's like, you're killing all my bees. Eat something else. <laughs> but she's getting really big, so she's doing a really good job. Um, I used to, with these kind of images, I would like basically just neglect the flower. I'd go to like two to one or things like that and try to get their faces, and I liked it with the flash. But on this day, I figured I'd try something a little bit different. So I shot it with my 90 mil at f3.5, so it was nice and like wide um, depth of field. And I shot it just with natural sunset. So it's being side lit by the setting sun. But what that's giving me now is these really cool shadows. Can you see the shadows under the spider's legs and the cast off on the back of the flower there? And they got a warm, ethereal looking image. And I don't. I don't take many pictures like this, so I'm, I'm really excited to start basically sh loosening up with things, showing insects in situ and spiders in situ, and then trying to get really creative in the way I compose. So, but I really like that beautiful soft lighting on there. These are, I love these weird little moss butterflies. Look at the shape on that one. It looks like it hates all other moss butterflies and it's done everything in its power to avoid touching anything else. It just creases me. These were growing up on a tree, and I couldn't quite reach them for where I was, so I put a 1.4 teleconverter onto my 90 mil, so that extended the reach there. And it means that I could get photos that I literally couldn't get before. Like, macro lenses and teleconverter, there's a weird relationship in it. It feels a bit strange, because like, well, they focus close, but it's not necessarily about the magnification, it's about getting further back. Um, but I was really, really grateful to have that one. And that is backlit by natural sunlight. And then uh, using aperture priority mode, just dialing down the exposure slightly, just to really bring out the way that light is shining through the stalks on those um, sporophytes. So if you've ever tried photographing bugs at the end of the day, you may notice that it's not easy. It's difficult to get, you know, one, you need a fast shutter speed, reasonably fast. Even if you're on a tripod, it is windy. You're going to be there for hours and hours. One of my favorite ways, again, around that is to shoot silhouettes, really. Just shoot at the brightest thing you can find, which is usually the sky, and then underexpose the shot so that you can get some silhouettes. And this feeds into um, a big part of my macro journey that I discovered at the end of last macro season. I learned something really cool and new, and then all the bugs basically went into hibernation. I don't want to say the word died, but they all hid until now. And it's only now that I've found that I can actually get back out and start exploring them. This is one of my favorite images. Basically, to date, it was serendipitous. So this mushroom is only about three millimeters, and it's growing on a leaf inside in my garden. It's wild. And it was one of my first shots with the 90 mil when it came out. I, I was lucky that I got to test it, um, but I had it for about two weeks. Before, before the launch. So I was like, oh my God, how am I gonna get something new, imaginative in two weeks? And then I forgot, I forgot that I wasn't that fit, right? And then I went to the gym and then I did my back in and then I shot everything from ground level. <laughs> but can anyone guess how I lit that thing on fire? <laughs> There's no fire, no mushrooms were harmed in the making of this picture. There's nothing there aside from natural light and some natural elements. It's cool in there. I'll give the game away. That's water on the leaf, and it's backlit with the sunset. But I hadn't even known, I was just photographing the mushroom, and then every, literally the, the sun aligned in front of me, and I saw it appear. And this is a thing, the more time you spend doing macro or anything, the more time you spend it, it's not, it's the indirect learning that we do. 
that teaches us the most. Because knowledge, I found, I don't know if you agree with this, is in itself a limitation. Because we get comfortable with the things that we know, and then we repeat it. But trying to do things that are different, that takes, you have to step into the unknown a little bit for that. But if you're like me, you don't really like doing that. You just find out by accident. So then it's all fine. It all works out in the end. But this is a natural light focus stack at um, four times magnification. It's bonkers, isn't it, what we can do with that 90. Hang on, I, go, I got my clicker the wrong way. Hang on. <laughs> there we go. I love bees. I thought I'd show you one that's alive because I've been showing you nasty ones <laughs> from the spiders on the internet for a while. But this illustrates really, you know, if you find a subject, right, and just basically stay around the area, don't move on. You never know what's going to happen next. So this is a different subject, but these were taken like, this far away from each other. I found a bumblebee and then it started eating inside of a crocus. That's wild, isn't it? And they sat there for ages, just kind of slumped over, just eating stuff in his face. And then eventually, he climbed inside and fell asleep. That's amazing, isn't it? I mean, look at that. And it's boiling hot, so he kicked one leg out to stay cool. And I, could not, I couldn't believe it. We sat there just watching this just unfold. And there was hand-holding, it was a bit breezy. So I shot a focus stack, and then my camera said, everything's a focus except for the leg. So then I had to shoot another focus stack for the leg and then blend in all 30 of them together later. But can you imagine if I didn't have that confirmation and I thought it was fine? I would have missed that. I mean, that, that's the biggest advantage. It's not the fact that this, the camera does the stacking. It's that it lets you know that it's worked. That's the advantage. But not everything has to be stacked. So I found this shield bug growing, uh, not growing, living in my garden. And there was a little raindrop there, so I figured we need a sense of scale here because that's a challenge, I think, with macro, show, show how big these things are. But this was shot at a 25th of a second at F14, and it was a single shot handheld. No tripod on that one, but it would be useful, of course. But it's amazing what we can do nowadays. Like every single book I read about macro photography when I was learning this thing, you could never shoot the 25th handheld going back in time. It's just astonishing what, the, what we're allowed to do now. This is a click beetle, and it's chilling out on a bluebell. And we've got this beautiful natural green color behind it, and that's really working against the purples there. But can you see how relaxed that beetle looks? His antennas are down. And that's because I haven't got it in his face, really. I lit it with a flash. It's give, like, I had it on a tripod. It was windy again, so I just set it up and waited for everything to settle, and then took a focus stack. But then, I was like, just in case, I got in close, and I did the same thing again. But this, this same scene, but just different focal lengths. But it's really nice that macro lenses give you that versatility. They're not always about focusing really close up. You can use them creatively. And they said, it, like, don't move on from your shot. Explore it until you've run out of options, or until it leaves. But look how chilled out it looks. And he's even got one hand up going, oh, no, leave me alone. I'm trying to, like, chill, bro. <laughs> okay, so this is a picture of a bee and a crab spider. They're friends, really. Um, I was really conscious of the fact that this spider had just caught the bee, and then I didn't want to disturb it by getting up close and then bothering it, essentially. So I set my camera up on, a tr on my J tripod, and I put a times two telegraphy on my macro lens. So I know I'm shooting at this at like 360 millimeters. So I'm miles away. I think, honestly, we're probably about this far away photographing it. So that means I don't have to disturb it. And I shot the ca in camera focus stack of 15 images just to make sure that I had enough depth of field there. But what I found is with a tripod work, you've got to like really pay attention to your compositions before you take the image. And it slows it down. So I, I had to like practice to get used to using one. So what I did in the end, I found like a composition I liked, held the camera in place, and then built a tripod around it. And I found that kind of worked. But who knows? Isn't that a beautiful lizard? This is a common lizard, and I found it fast asleep inside of a tree. And this was down like, um, near Patal, but, and it was fast asleep in a tree. And um, I had to shoot it at 6,400 hours, though, because it was so dark. Um, but I, we got topaz now, and now we have to treat in there. Um, I only just discovered it. But it looks so serene. It's fast asleep. 
and usually when I see one of these lizards, you like look in their direction and they're gone. So to find one that was fast asleep, and I know exactly where it lives. So I went back there about two months after and it's still there. So I'm gonna try to kind of build up a little bit of a project around it. But you notice that composing on this image wasn't, wasn't simple because it's hidden essentially and, and it's got the same tones as the background. So I had to try to try to figure out how can I still show it? So I figured that the eye placement in the composition would probably be the thing that drew us to it. So I put it in the center and near the top in the middle. So ev everything points up towards the eye and then we can work backwards from there then if we want to explore the image. Isn't that wicked? I love these nursery web spiders. I found this one in Kenfig Pool Nature Reserve and it was rested on a leaf. And they shot it, again this is a focus stack, and then what I loved about it was this side light, this beautiful directional lighting and this really, really crazy shape that the spider's in. It almost looks like a medallion, it's kind of like half circular. And then we've got this awesome shadow just coming off the side of it there. I know flower, I love photographic flowers. I know a bit of a, a thing for them. But uh, trying to get different pictures of flowers is, is challenging. So I figured by getting low, I'm pointing straight up and then incorporating a little bit of grass at the bottom of the frame because then it just insinuates and suggests that it's outdoors. And um, it's my favorite lighting again. There was shade on the flower and the sun was lighting up the trees in the background and that's what created this beautiful, beautiful magical look. And that was with my 60 mil macro lens. I love it. I just thought this was a really cool bee. I know, it's lovely, isn't it? Uh, this is, um, earlier on I said about lack of light can be useful sometimes. So this is taken on a really shockingly hot day. But we managed to find this bee resting and it was in the shade. So it was perfectly diffuse. But depth of field is really tricky with these kind of things. So I shot um, 15 images, f5.6 aperture with um, a focus differential in my camera five, just to make sure that I had enough depth of field there. But we've got a gradient of color in the background. And these are the things that I'm kind of looking for. It's not solid green, it's got like suggestions of other colors in there. And I can't really, no, that's not planned. It's just, just looking around and trying to find things of interest. Mixed lighting techniques. So there comes a time where I like to blend flash and ambient light. And even when I'm using flash, I try my best to hide that it's there. I'm not really keen on like, how flash looks if it's the main light source. But that's just me. Um, so here is the last picture I got of a damselfly in the last season. And you can see it's like insanely backlit. It looks amazing. But it's not dissimilar to the, the other damselfly I showed you guys earlier on. It's basically the same shot. So you're exposing for the brightness bit, and then all you then do is fill it in with flash. And that's how you get that really cool kind of technique there. And I've been really exploring that lately. But I've had to seek out an actual place where this shot works. They don't work everywhere, because uh, especially where I live, I live in the valley, so the sun usually sets behind the mountain, and I'm still down here somewhere. So I have to get up on high ground. So when it sets, it's in line with my subjects. So I had to go basically look in. But that's what metal detectors for. Um, but again, if you've got a subject that's cooperating, don't leave it. So this is the same damselfly, but I managed to get in close as well and shoot the two image focus stack. It was windy like this. It was super windy. I wish that I got more of it in focus, but we wish for everything in macro photography, don't we? We never actually end up with a shot that we want, do we? It's rare. You get like 80% of the way there if you're lucky. So I went out, and this is taken with a telephoto lens. So this is a 4150 f2.8. Um, the thing that I found amazing was that there was nothing else for miles on this, but they managed to grow so close to each other that they're physically touching. And they was just like these, and then a deer like eight miles away, and that was it. But the picture is a bit black, in my opinion. So I stole my friend Rob's um, eight millimeter lens, photographed it at a wide angle, and left it with a torch on my phone. Um, and it's really about experimenting and playing around. So he exposed for the, the sky again. So these were silhouetted. And then shot at f11 so everything would be in one go. And then just lit it quickly like that with a phone. Easy peasy stuff, but it's just about finding the opportunities and seeing what we can find. Reminds me of a Pink Floyd kind of album cover. It's very Division Bell, isn't it? Thank you, Topaz. So this is 
a leaf that I found, and it was inside of a river, and the water was like pouring off it constantly. So I had a lot of opportunities to try to get this shot, but I was there for ages trying to get it. I couldn't like time it right. Um, but the lighting was really bad. I was in the middle of the forest, and everything just looked a bit shocking. So I sacrificed my my phone. I turned the torch on. I just basically put it in the river. I was like, "The matter. It's not even mine. It'll be fine." But what that did, it illuminated the background, created that magical bokeh effect. But I. I really needed a fast shutter speed. So I had to shoot this at a thousandth of a second just to try to get that droplet in there. So that meant I was at 6,400 ISO. I had like F3.5 to get it in. But it worked out in the end. So this is something I'm going to explore. But I think I'm going to go, I might actually get one today and get a proper light. <laughs> so I, keep my, I don't have to like, you know, worry about phoning it home. I, it's, I've mentioned focus stacking like a thousand times, but has anyone never heard of focus stacking before? Anyone like properly new? Ah, okay, at least there's a couple of us. So basically what it means is that we shoot and blend multiple images taken at different focus distances. It's easier to show than to explain. Anyway, that's basically what it looks like when you look through a macro lens. You've got 99% out of focus. Um, but you see that the tips of his antennas there are just in focus. And then if I move the camera slightly, or just the focus, then we can push the depth of field, the, p the plane of focus, into the scene. And then basically, th we can um, replicate this, and then take another shot, and another shot. And then when you blend all those together, you end up with a picture that's got a lot more depth of field. That's basically the technique of it. Everything has to be still, reasonably still. Antennas are the, the worst. But there are ways and means. And earlier, I mentioned that I like to have my rule of thirds grid set up in the viewfinder, that is really beneficial for if we're trying to do things like handheld focus stacking, because it means that we can use those guides to make sure that the rest of our images will align. So this is shot one of my sequence, and that is shot nine in the sequence. But because I could keep things composed on the rule of thirds there, it means that they're going to align. So if you don't have in-camera stacking, or if you need to shoot it manually, use those crosshairs as a visual guide for you to get there. And then that's the end result as well then. So that's nine images with my E1 Mark II and the 60 millimeter macro lens. And look at this, covered in rain. It's, it's such a cool thing. And the ladybird itself looks like dirty. It's not like the prettiest bug shot ever. But that's what I, I, I kind of like, like that about it. It looks a bit more edgy and a bit more like gnarly looking for a ladybird anyway. <laughs> <laughs> focus stacking allows us to overcome the physical um, limitations that photography has on us. Ugh. I don't like being told what to do by my camera. So if I shoot at f11, it means that my background's going to come into focus. And also the aperture blades kind of change to how the background behaves. But if I shoot at f2.8 to do a focus stack, it means that I can get a nice circle of bokeh in the background. And I get more depth of field on my subject as well. So that is f2.8, 15 images. And both of these are lit with my phone. But you see on the bottom of that frame, you could just about make out the, the glow of the light. That just lets it way more light, so it looks a little bit prettier. And focus stacking, when you use it kind of creatively, it can get, help you get pictures that you just can't get. So this is a tiny, tiny, tiny mushroom three, four millimeters, something like that. And underneath it, I hope I'm not blocking it. Um, there you go. Underneath it, you've got a springtail. So what I did was I f did a focus stack of the mushroom first because I could see the springtail kind of like poodling around under the leaf. I waited for the springtail to come out. I then shot the last image and then blended them all together. But this is, these are the things that we kind of accidentally learn when we're out, isn't it? And it's just an idea that came while I was in the moment. I was like, how on earth am I going to get this in one? It can't be done. I said, how am I going to get it? Stack it first and then wait. It's kind of like street photography, I guess, where you, or landscapes or anything, where you find and wait. But I had to stack it first and hope that it worked. But I love that pot photograph. Uh, it's one of the, um, my coolest ones. Focus stacking can help us out in low light. So I've included my exif info over there just to kind of help out. But I'm shooting at 800. F10 at a fifth of a second, and that's handheld. And no way am I going to get both of those in focus, am I? Impossible. But if I do a little focus stack, watch now, look at that. So I shot 15 images, and then it means that I can shoot um, both of them in focus without having to change my exif info, try to like get too grainy and things like that. But a fifth of a second, it's, it's astonishing, isn't it? 
I'm amazed by your own tech. I'm such a nerd. I'm such a nerd for it. Creating depth. Now, that's a challenging thing with macro photography, so I'd like to use depth of field, light, and scale to try and get um, some sort of interpretation of depth in there. So this is a mushroom, a big one for a change, and it was growing in Dufferin Woods, which is a woodland trust place near where I live. And I put my 30 millimeter macro lens basically right up against the moss. I got some backlight illuminating the mushroom and the moss. And then I shot um, a single frame at f3.5 just to create that sort of shallow depth of field and that three-dimensional effect. And we got some magical sparkle stuff going on as well. I love this fly. And we can create depth by using depth of field. So you know if I'd managed to, if I shot a stack and I carried it on through and then got his back in focus, his head wouldn't have been popping out like this. It, we wouldn't have had that difference in uh, texture and tone to make it look three-dimensional. So, so a lot of the time, if we sh this is a portrait of a bug. This isn't a study. I'm trying to get his head in. So it's not about getting the entire thing sharp, you know, um, face the butt. It's about just getting his head and eyes in, just to get a little bit more creative. I, I, I'll break this image down. So this is a oh, geranium. Please tell me that's what it's called. It just slipped out. So that's, this is a rose. If we're going to go wrong, go wrong big time. This is a daffodil, and that's got a frog on it. <laughs> this is a crab spider and a, f and a flower. And you'll see that um, in order for me to get some sort of depth in there, I had to side light it. And with my cam, oh, he's lucky, isn't he? He set it up. Put my clicker down a minute, because I dropped that last year, and I had to run down there and pick it up. <laughs> if I want to light the subject, I have to turn my camera like this. Now I have side lighting all the time. So now I have to figure out which direction of side light do I want. So because if I tipped it this way, I would have been backlighting that flower. And then it would have done that thing that rabbit's ears do and they like glow. And then the picture would have not have been about the spider on the flower. It would have been mostly about the flower with like a spider kind of hanging on. So it was a way of just trying to decide, okay, which way am I gonna go about it? And at the same time, I also had to do a little focus stack as well because the depth of field was super shallow. So this is just three frames blended with a side light and a nice dark background just to make it kind of stand out quite a bit. When we're shooting at very high magnifications, we don't have a ton of like leeway in terms of how we compose our images. It helps if you like zoom out or move back a little, but sometimes you can't even do that. Well, if your subject's this big, you have to stay at the, the maximum magnification anyway. You don't have much choice. And we want to strive for engaging images, don't we? Um, we want people to stop and look at the photographs. And that's what I'm trying to like, get into, really, is I don't want it to be just be added to the pool of whatever's out there. I want it to, to hold, hold the attention a little bit. And, uh, and on a deeper level than detail, really. It's like looking at it and taking it. What's, what's going on? What's going on here, I wonder? I like to use color connection and clarity. And that kind of helps um, to get your point across there. So we've got a bright blue, colorful um, damselfly looking as dead in the eye. So then we've got the connection and the color. And clarity means two things. It's detail, but also how easy is it to read the actual photograph. So there's nothing in the background that's obscuring the, the, um, the damselfly. But you know those blades of grass that he's holding on to? They, to me, they add so much to the photograph because now we've got like dynamic angles everywhere. They create triangles. And his arms create triangles. And I just think it's like those repeating shapes look really, really cool. And I would love to be able to tell you that I noticed that at the time. But, but I didn't. <laughs> no, <laughs> I didn't. I, re I realized it like afterward. But I think subconsciously, you know, we all do this. We find something beautiful or something there that we don't even realize it. And then we kind of find it later, don't we? And I think that's what's happened with my photography journey lately. It's, I find it more of like an artistic and creative way of shooting that is, I don't know why, Lord knows, but it's getting there. Look at that wicked, that's one of my favorites, I show this all the time. But this was on my front garden in my second home in the Amazon rainforest. It was only my second home for a week and four days and then I had to come back. I got sent away by Olympus to, do, um, to launch the EM1 Mark III and I still can't believe, still can't even believe I said that. But I was tasked with getting some really interesting pictures. And this was one of them. I really, I sent this off, but I think it's pretty cool. We've got loads of color there. And we got this bug, ran up the flower, 
peek this head around, and I really got that because I missed t on two occasions basically this picture, but it stayed there. I was like, I'm not going until this bug goes. And I managed to get this shot at f2.8, so his, both his eyes are nicely in focus, but we've got that beautiful wall of color surrounding it. It connects, it's a bug, it's this big, it's halfway across the world, and we're all looking at it and laughing at it. I think that's what this, that's what this thing is all about. This was in the National Botanical Gardens of Wales. I love these flower beetles. And you know, you get colors that complement each other. And it happens all the time in nature anyway. If you find a flower, chances are a bug is gonna land on it. And then it's the case of just staying with it and then trying to shoot it. Five whole minutes. Thanks, man. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Right. <laughs> Ready? This is gonna be like the end of one of those adverts where they start talking at 500 miles an hour. Single shot, really fast shutter speed, flash. But nice complementary colors. Experiment with things like double exposures. So I found these buttercups in my garden, shot them to death, not literally to death, and then I thought, oh, I gotta do something different. And I love Sandra Bartaka's work. If you look, at, look into her, she's amazing. And she does a lot of uh, multiple exposures, but she's, I think, one of the best in the world at it. So I took a, took a pic, I didn't do it as good as her, but um, I'm practicing. But these are the things, these are part of the journey now. But I did this one the other day where I got a spider walking down a web, and then I took one exposure and got it coming up the other side. I did another exposure. Didn't work, but I'm trying. <laughs> I'm gonna go to this bit. I'll just, I'll stop you with my favorite ones. It, we don't always need a super, super mega detailed picture. This was a damselfly shot at 2.8, a two to one. But it, the fact that it looks blurry and it's just his eyes, I think, that is engaging, and it forces us to look and dissect it. If it's handed to us on a plate, we're gonna go whoop, look straight past it. This is a tiny moth, and it's framed beautifully among some ferns. So this is the thing, if we include natural light, so this is being backlit by the sun, shoot little looser, and give our subject somewhere to live. It just brings things up. But this is with my 90 mil, and it's lit with a flash as well. Look for points of interest. These, this isn't a good picture, really, but I really couldn't get it to work, so I decided I'll just photograph the raindrops instead, and then I got that instead. So by literally just changing the camera from there to there, we can get these. I t I would, like, I'm gonna have to tell you more about this later. <laughs> this is backlit by my own house window. So this was shot in the nighttime at 12,000 ISO at the 25th of a second. But it looks like it's in the middle of the woods, doesn't it? But it ain't. But my God, does look like it looks like the woods now, to be fair. I caught this guy doing a roly-poly. If you know, you try to photograph one of these, you take one pitch and it'll run away from you. If you found that. I was like, right, it ran away and then it fell over. And I was like, I'm not helping you up until I photo. So then I did this little thing. I took a 15 image focus stack with my 90 mil. And you can even see it's got a tear in his eye from all the sit-ups it's been doing. But these are points of interest. I'm gonna go to ones that are like useful to you guys in a minute. There we go. Canada geese are this big in real life. That's true. The 90 mil is amazingly versatile. It's super versatile. So I was sitting by the pond, and this was the same day as my next couple of things, and it came up close enough that it'd be rude to not take a shot in there. But keep, it, keep that 90 mil, it's, it's amazing. And then I took a photo of his feathers, but it shot at F11, so we got edge to edge sharpness. And, but you know, these were so taken months apart. Hang on, hang on. I'm gonna get to here. This is one of my favorite photographs ever. This is a girdle snail. I found it in my garden and it is literally lit by the setting sun. And I underexposed it just a little to make it really blue and really showcase those beautiful colors and the translucency of it. I mean, this is a snail. We can see it everywhere. And this is a thing, macro is th the best thing in the world. This is my favorite. I think this is my favorite. This is my favorite. So I spotted this flower plant and it was growing in the pond. So I, t I was basically drawn in by the symmetry and all of that stuff. I s you see that boca ball? I meticulously angled the camera up so that it was framed there. This, this is the kind of cycle I'm getting with it now. <laughs> and then, um, but what I didn't realize was can you see the fly sat in the middle of the picture there? Look at this now. Look, here's a fly blowing bubbles, sat in the center of the universe like that. 
and it'll reveal things to you. But I'm glad I didn't notice it at the time because I would have missed this competition. So I'm glad I didn't see it until I got home. And this is the last picture I took, and I think this is basically a combination of where I'm at right now. It's including dynamic backlighting, focus stacking. I couldn't even see through the viewfinder at this stage. It was blinded by it. And it's lit with a flash just to balance out that light. Thank you, Dior Cavall, and there's my stuff. Thank you, guys.